I must say it is really a great pleasure and, and I will take this, this uh, moment of time to introduce to you Dr. Sessler, who is with us today, Professor Sessler. So he will introduce us new developments on temperature measurement possibilities and he will give a talk about temperature management. And then we have the whole story and can discuss. Please, Dr. Sessler. Good. Thank you very much, and good afternoon. I'll, I'll start with a disclosure. Uh, the Department of Outcomes Research is funded by many companies interested in temperature monitoring and management, including 3M. Um, I'm on an advisory board for 3M. All fees are donated to charity. I thus have no financial interest in anything I'm going to be talking about today. And I drive a 13-year-old car. Temperature monitoring is important because if you don't monitor the temperature, you simply won't know if your patient is getting hypothermic. There's no other way to know except by looking. There are four core temperature sites that are reliable and essentially interchangeable. And that's the pulmonary artery, distal esophagus, nasopharynx, and tympanic membrane measured with a thermocouple. So you can use those four sites interchangeably. The trouble, of course, is that there are some patients in whom you don't have ready access to those sites. And in those, you can use other sites that are pretty good as long as you use care in choosing appropriate patients and make the measurements carefully. And that's mouth, axilla, and bladder. Oral temperatures are remarkably good, actually. I, I wouldn't use them during general anesthesia, but preoperatively and postoperatively, oral temperatures are simple, quick, and reliable. On the other hand, there are some sites that I am not fond of, and that includes forehead skin temperature, for that matter, unadjusted skin temperature anywhere in the body. It's not really very reliable. The infrared so-called tympanic membrane or oral canal monitors. They do not work reliably. As far as I can tell, they're random number generators. Infrared tympanic artery monitors, these little swipe thermometers, also do not work reliably. And finally, rectal temperature is not a reliable core temperature. At equilibrium, it's fine. The trouble is that there is a huge delay between core temperature changes and rectal temperature changes. For example, during malignant hyperthermia, core temperature shoots up, rectal temperature stays absolutely flat. So it's not a good measurement site. I want to talk a little bit more about skin temperature monitoring, because I'm going to contrast unadjusted skin temperature monitor with a different type of skin temperature monitor. There are some problems with skin temperature monitoring, and one of them is vasoconstriction. So Andrea talked about vasoconstriction being a thermoregulatory defense. It is an effective defense. It's very good at constraining metabolic heat to the core, but it does so by decreasing cutaneous blood flow. This is most prominent in the fingers and toes, in the arteria venous shunts. Fingertip blood flow decreases by more than a factor of 10 with thermoregulatory vasoconstriction. And you can see that here. Uh, without, anesthe Oops. Uh, without anesthesia or with anesthesia, vasoconstriction decreases flow about tenfold. The consequence, as Andrew explained, is that you get a core temperature plateau. So here is an example of the plateau. Core temperature, which was going down until people vasoconstricted, here at elapsed time zero, then stays constant. The reason it stays constant is that vasoconstriction constrains metabolic heat to the core. And 
this curve here is the amount of heat that is constrained. It turns out to be about 20 kilocalories over three hours. That's enough to keep core temperature constant even though heat is leaving the body still. So vasoconstriction works, it's a great thing, but a consequence of vasoconstriction is that it changes skin temperature. Specifically, it changes the relationship between skin temperature and core temperature. So these are volunteers who go from sweating, which is complete vasodilation, to shivering, which is complete vasoconstriction. And you can see that the core to forehead gradient changes. So that's the first problem with skin temperature. The second problem is that it depends critically on ambient temperature. And this curve shows you the change in the forehead to core gradient as a function of ambient temperature. The reason this is important is that ambient temperature changes quite a bit in operating rooms. We all think that you set the thermostat at 21 degrees and it sits there for the whole operation. It's not true. It's colder than 21 when you come into the operating room and typically because of all the equipment and the people in operating rooms, they heat up by about two degrees during surgery. The air conditioning basically can't keep up with heat generation. So ambient temperature changes during surgery and that changes the uh, gradient between forehead skin temperature and core temperature. So that's, that's the second problem. Um, this is an example of, of what I told you before of rectal temperature staying constant during malignant hyperthermia while esophageal temperature increases. But the reason I'm showing it to you is that skin temperature also barely changed. So skin temperature during malignant hyperthermia doesn't increase. The reason it doesn't increase is that catecholamine concentrations are about 20 times normal. And so that causes intense vasoconstriction. And so the increase in core temperature isn't reflected in forehead skin. So just when you need it most, unadjusted skin temperature fails. So I want to go on now and talk about a new device. It's a 3M device. Um, the concept, though, is not new. The concept was developed in the 40s. Uh, there has been a device based on this concept available in Japan. It was never available in the United States. So this is the first example of a device available in the United States, but the basic concept is very well established. And I'd like to take you through the concept. Um, what it consists of is having a warm core, the skin, that's normal, that's part of you, and then the device starts after that. And it starts with an insulation layer. So you have a layer of insulation, and on top of that, you have a heater. The heater is servo-controlled, and that's, that's the key part here, so that Heat from the core comes up to the skin surface, goes into the insulator, and the heater above the insulator is servo-controlled so that the temperature on the top of the insulator, let me show you, on the top of the insulator and the bottom of the insulator is exactly the same. So temperature here and temperature here is the same. The second law of thermodynamics says that there can be no flow of heat if there is not a temperature gradient. So by virtue of servo controlling the heater, you've made a perfect insulator. No heat can pass through this insulator because the temperature is the same at the top and the bottom. So what happens then? Heat from the core comes up and it meets this perfect insulator, and it cannot escape to the environment. It gets stuck there at the skin surface. The consequence 
is that you get a tunnel of core temperature that extends from the device down through the skin towards the core. It doesn't work forever, but it works for about a centimeter. So if you put this device in a part of the body where core temperature is about a centimeter below the skin surface, what you get is something that's essentially core temperature. So to review, you have a perfect insulator, heat from the core comes up, it bounces off the insulator. It cannot go through the insulator by definition. It's a perfect insulator. And so it begins to accumulate under the skin until it equals core temperature. And that gives you what's called an isothermal tunnel into the core. The process does not take very long. It take, takes about three minutes for this to work. It does not work the second you put the device on, but a few minutes after you put it on, you develop the isothermal tunnel and you get a pretty reliable reading of core temperature. So I said that the concept is well established. So we and many others have tested the general concept of zeroing heat flux. It's called a zero heat flux thermometer. So we and others have tested this extensively over the years. The concept works extremely well, but the question of course is, does the current device work? And the answer is yes, it, it does work. I will show you those data in a minute. This is what the device looks like. So it's, it's a little monitor and it has a little disposable skin surface pad. And all you have to do is put the pad on the forehead. Now what's deceptive here is that this pad looks just like any other skin temperature monitor, but it's not. It actually contains all those elements I told you about. The insulator, the heater, the device contains the servo control mechanism. And so even though this looks like it's just a skin surface monitor, it really isn't. It's a zero heat flux thermometer that accurately gives you core temperature. Okay, how accurately? Here's how accurately. So this is a new type of Bland-Altman plot. It's a three-dimensional Bland-Altman plot. So the y-axis is the average of the measured temperature and core temperature, and the x-axis here is the difference between the um, zero heat flux thermometer, the device we're testing, and core temperature, which happened to be pulmonary artery in this case. The z-axis tells you how many points were at each of these values. And what you see is that nearly all of the points were within a half degree of true core temperature as measured by the pulmonary artery. So this is a complicated plot, and it's complicated because there were tens of thousands of data points that we we're dealing with, but the take-home message is that nearly all the reference, nearly all the experimental temperatures, the zero heat flux temperatures, were within about a half a degree of core temperature. That meets our definition of an adequate thermometer. Okay. So much for thermometry. Now I want to go on and talk a little bit about how to prevent hypothermia. The easiest way to reduce heat loss in surgical patients is to cover them with an insulator. And insulation works. Most any insulator, ranging from plastic bags, cotton blankets, surgical drapes, or space blankets, reduces heat loss by about 30%. And 30% is a clinically important reduction. So by all means use insulation. Of course insulation doesn't work by magic. It works only in the area that you've covered. So it's 30% heat loss from covered area. So use insulation, cover as much of the patient as you can. It makes almost no difference what you use to insulate the patient. So a space blanket hardly works better than a plastic bag. 
Don't pay extra for a space blanket. It's not worth it. The reason that they're all about the same is that what's actually providing the insulation is not the material, it's the air that's trapped under the material. And the air trapped under the material is about the same, independent of the material. So use any old thing that's handy, a blanket, surgical drapes, whatever, a plastic bag, they all work fine, cover as much of the patient as possible. If one layer keeps patients normal thermic, that's all you need to do because your goal is to keep patients normal thermic. We don't care how, believe me, we don't care how you keep them normal thermic. But if one layer doesn't work, you might think, okay, I'm gonna add two more layers and that will triple insulation. I'll go from 30% uh, reduction in heat loss to 90%. Uh, which would be great, except that that's not the way the physics works. When you go from one layer to three layer, insulation goes from only 30% to 50%. Furthermore, it makes no difference whether you use warm blankets or cold blankets. Patients love warm blankets, so by all means use warm blankets. It makes patients feel comfortable, but it doesn't change the amount of insulation. The heat content of a blanket is just unimportant. So if one layer works, that's great. If one layer doesn't work though, adding a couple of more layers of passive insulation is not gonna be sufficient. You're gonna to need to move on to some active system. And the one you'll probably choose is forced air. There are now many warming systems. I don't care which one you use. I only care that patients are normothermic at the end. But forced air is by far and away the most commonly used system. And the reason it's common and well liked is that it's effective, it's safe, it's easy to use, and it's inexpensive. It's pretty hard to beat combination. But use whatever you want, just keep patients normal thermic. There's been some discussion recently about forced air disturbing laminar flow. First of all, the biggest study on laminar flow shows that it increases the risk of wound infections. So it's a little unclear why laminar flow is used. This is basically a technique or technology that was introduced because it sounded logical on the basis of no studies. The studies that have been done subsequently are completely unimpressive. Best available evidence is that laminar flow increases the risk of wound infection, certainly doesn't decrease it. And of course, only a small fraction of patients get laminar flow anyway. But you might ask, okay, does hot air rising from a forced air warmer disturb the laminar flow column? And the answer is no, we simply don't see it. We tested it um, using European standards, which are fairly rigorous. And what it involves is pumping a bunch of particles into the air of the operating room, turning on the laminar flow system, and seeing whether the number of particles decreases by at least a factor of 100. That's the European requirement. It does, and it does so without forced air warming, but it does so almost equally with a forced air blower set to ambient temperature and with a forced air blower set to warming. Basically, we see no evidence that forced air warming disturbs laminar flow, even if you think laminar flow is effective, which is highly, highly debatable. The final topic is fluid warming. You cannot warm patients by warming fluids. And the reason is that you cannot warm fluids to much above body temperature. So with the amount that you can increase fluids above body temperature times the amount of fluid that you can possibly give a patient, you just have no hope of warming patients. And warming fluids in no way compensates for redistribution hypothermia, convective and radiative losses from the patient's skin and from evaporative losses from within the surgical incision. That said, 
you sure can cool patients by giving large volumes of cold fluid. One liter of crystalloid at ambient temperature reduces mean body temperature in a typical adult by a quarter of a degree. One unit of blood from the refrigerator reduces mean body temperature in an adult by a quarter of a degree. It's half the volume and it's twice as cold. So it makes no sense to give five liters of crystalloid and then hook up a fluid warmer to give one unit of blood. They, they have exactly the same cooling capacity. So if you're giving large amounts of fluid, you should warm the fluids. If you're giving small amounts, don't bother. I would say if you are not giving at least one liter per hour, don't bother with fluid warming. And personally, I would probably wait until you have about two liters per hour before giving fluid warming. But the point I want to make is that fluid warming is never a first way of warming patients. You need to use some surface warming first, and then if you are giving a very large amount of fluid, add fluid warming to surface warming. It's just never the way to start, and by itself, it is insufficient. So where does that leave us? That leaves us with a rule, which is that you should monitor the core temperature because if you don't monitor the core temperature, you simply won't know if your patients are hypothermic. I'll give you a pass if you are doing 10-minute operations or 20-minute operations that you don't have to monitor the temperature for 10 or 20 minutes. But if you're doing a general anesthetic over 30 minutes, you really should monitor the core temperature. And you should monitor core temperature with neuraxial anesthesia as well. Patients having neuraxial anesthesia get just as hypothermic as patients having general anesthesia for the same operation. Neuraxial anesthesia causes plenty of hypothermia. There is no reason to believe that patients having neuraxial anesthesia are protected from any of the consequences of of hypothermia that Andrea gave you. So the second rule is maintain normothermia. There are many, many serious complications of hypothermia. Not every patient is susceptible to every complication, but almost every patient is susceptible to at least one of them. Maintaining normothermia is the standard of care. I don't care how you keep people warm. Most people use forced air, but use whatever you want. But I feel very strongly that you need to maintain core temperature. Thank you much.